All right, guys, we're back to business as usual. We got a major progress update to show you on the XJ Cherokee that we're swapping into six liter LQ4. Um, last time we worked on this project, we took care of the fuel system, and since then I've taken care of a whole bunch of stuff. My name's LT, and on this channel, out of my small garage at home, I build custom, high-performance, and off-road trucks. So if any of that content appeals to you, or the occasional race, help me out and hit that subscribe button because we're trying to reach 100,000 subs by the end of 2021. That's our major milestone we're trying to reach, and I need your help to make it happen. So, XJ Cherokee, this is a 98 two-door sport Cherokee. The owner brought it to me completely stripped down. The old engine was out, the transmission was out, and there's been a bunch of work done to the chassis. So it's a really cool project truck. We've got Dana 60s front and rear from Dynatech. It's got 456s, it's got electric lockers, it has a Rusty's long arm suspension kit on it. Uh, it's got the frame stiffeners, it has the radius arm front end as part of the long arm, hydraulic steering, there's just a whole bunch of cool parts on this thing and we needed to make more horsepower. So I was tasked with installing and swapping a six liter LQ4. It's got a small cam in it. It's got some headers from Novak. It's running the Novak conversion mounts. Um, it's got an LS6 car intake on it, a LS simple accessory drive on there. That's kind of the basics of the project. I think the very last thing that I showed you guys back before the Pro Touring Truck Shootout was the fuel system. We used one of the Novak uh, fuel adapters so we can run the Jeep pump in the tank and then a Corvette style external filter slash regulator assembly. Then we ran the fuel lines up to the engine. But that's kind of where we left things off. And since then, I've got a whole lot of stuff taken care of. Now, I didn't make any videos on this content, but today I am going to show you basically everything that I did take care of. And the reason I didn't do a video is because a lot of the stuff, it just takes a lot of time. You know, each individual thing maybe doesn't take a whole lot, but there's so many little things. It's that part of the project where the major pieces and parts are in, you know, the engine's in, the transmission's attached, the mounts are made, the exhaust is in. But, I mean, we've got the exhaust, uh, not the exhaust, we've got the wiring, we've got the plumbing, and each of those systems takes a little bit of time just to take care of. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff to show you. Uh, I'll try to cover everything. I, I always try to show you guys every part of the swap, like so if you're going to try this on your own. Uh, there won't be anything that's missing from here, but there's a lot of information headed at you, so buckle up, let's get to it. So I'm just going to kind of go in the order that I actually did the work in. There's really no rhyme or reason or there's no specific sequence that this stuff has to be done in. But I started with a cooling system, so let's kind of go over that. The first objective was to permanently mount the radiator, AC condenser, and the trans cooler. The customer does live in Texas, so it is going to get hot down there, which means AC is pretty much a necessity. And a VA is going to generate a lot more heat in any vehicle than a straight six. So keeping this thing cool was important. Uh, because of that, we're running a Novak conversion radiator. It's the same physical shape as the XJ Cherokee radiator, but it's a lot thicker. And it's a cross-flow design, which means the coolant, the hot coolant from the block comes in on the top. It circulates across the core down that tank and back this way, and the lower hose is also on the passenger side here. Uh, it is a lot thicker than stock, which is good because it has more surface area to cool off the coolant, but it does make it a little more difficult, if not impossible, to mount the AC condenser using the factory setup. So that was the first major modification that I had to make. So from the factory, uh, let's see, get that out of the way. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there are two little brackets, little simple L brackets that are riveted on to the bottom of the condenser, one there and one there. And the first problem is they're just not long enough because of the extra thickness of the radiator. So that was pretty simple. I, drilled out the rivets, I cut the bottom off the bracket, I added just a simple longer piece, and if it'll focus, I just welded it back on there. So the bottom attaches just like the factory, it just goes right over the aluminum mounting stud that goes down into the rubber isolator. And then up top, and this mount's totally different from the stock setup, normally there's like a rubber isolator in there with a couple bolts, uh, the Novak radiator does not have that mounting system, so instead all I did was took a couple of pieces of aluminum, you got to bend a little kink in them like that. This is a stock mounting point here, and that's where they mount a little bit differently, but the AC condenser is mounted, it's isolated in rubber effectively, and it fits, and we've got probably like 3 eighths of an inch gap between the condenser and the radiator, so nothing's gonna rub together, nothing's gonna leak. The trans cooler was provided with the transmission. Uh, it's just mounted with those little plastic zip tie thingies going through the condenser, and that's our little AN hose there. As far as the rest of the cooling system, 
You do have to get a little bit creative. So the bottom radiator hose is some of a hose from a, uh, the lower hose actually from a 03 Silverado. Just have to cut the ends off of it. The upper radiator hose is actually two different hoses. One of them is, let's see the part number right here. I just went into the parts store and looked around for something that was the right size. So it's a Gates 22532. And then actually, if you got two of those, that would work. The other upper hose on this side is from like a LS3 Camaro, but it's inch and a quarter hose. We've got the radiator cap adapter in the middle. And then I went over and stuck one of these just generic Amazon overflow coolant bottles on the uh, fender well right there. The rest of the trans lines, I did a little bit of work to do just to make sure they're gonna not rub anything. They're not gonna hit. Used a bunch of cushion clamps to mount them so you know we don't rub through any hard edges or anything like that. There's an edge there. You never want your hose to rub so it will cut through and cause a leak. And then underneath, he's got a bunch of these uh, billet aluminum hose separators that the customer provided. So I got some of those cushion clamps where they attach to the frame, more separators. And then I did take the time to make a little uh, bracket right there. It goes on the inside starter bolt and it comes down and it provides a nice point to mount the hoses to there, kind of out of the way once again. So they don't rub or don't chafe on anything. Normally there's a hard line in here, uh, but when you're working with cloth braided and hose, you wanna make sure you don't have anything rubbed through. One final change that I did is I added some DEI fire sleeve, if I can show you on the last little bit, just because the hoses run near the exhaust, there's probably a good three inch air gap between, but there's a lot of radiant heat in there. So just by having some of that insulating material, uh, it'll just stop any damage potentially from happening to the hose. So that is what wraps up the cooling system uh, it's pretty straightforward just a lot of little things you get to customize um, so next let's see i guess next we'll move on to the wiring so normally in an xj the battery sits kind of right here on the passenger side front corner at a 45 degree angle but uh, because the accessory drive that we're running the ac compressor takes up probably a good third of the space of the battery so we can't mount it here. I thought about putting like an Optima dry cell on its side, but even to do that, I'd have to cut a bunch of the inner fender structure away, which would interfere with the tire. If he's ever flexing the thing out with a wheel turned left, it would stuff up in there. And also he mentioned that he's probably gonna do like a wheelbase stretch at some point, which would even interfere with the battery there. So uh, a battery cannot go on the passenger side. On the driver's side here, we're running the air intake, so the battery won't fit there. And there's really no other good space in the whole engine bay to mount the battery. I even thought about putting it like under the radiator, but I just wasn't happy with that. So I am waiting on a battery box. I believe that'll be here probably today or tomorrow. And the owner took the back seat out. He said he's no longer gonna be using a rear seat. So we're doing a remote mount. That's kind of the setup that we agreed on. So I'm running a sealed battery box. I have to build a mount back there. And then we're gonna run the battery cables, both positive and negative, all the way from behind the driver's seat, kind of along the inside of the cab. And that way they're not gonna get rubbed on anything underneath the truck. And then I think what the plan is, they're gonna come through the firewall there, up and over where some of this other wiring harness goes to. And then all the uh, heavy gauge wires are gonna meet up at this junction right here. Um, so I've got a lot of the heavy gauge wiring run. Uh, one goes to this junction block here. This should provide power to the rest of the Jeep stuff. Uh, I'm not entirely positive on if I'll have to make any other connections. I haven't done a whole lot of research yet. But so we've got one gauge here that feeds the fuse panel. We've got one that goes down to the starter, one that comes from the alternator. And then the big battery cable from the battery is gonna attach here. And then this cool little uh, junction block has all these little studs around the outside. So like when I run my cooling fans, I can have just you know one accessory on each one of those studs. Uh, from there, let's see, we also worked on the engine harness. This is a Holley Terminator X Max. Uh, it came with the injector harness, the coil harness, and all the Holly stuff kind of runs along the valve covers and it all bunches up right at the back there. That's kind of how their stuff is routed. I originally wanted to mount the computer inside the cabin, but I just didn't find a good spot that I was happy with. So let me show you the bracket that I came up with to kind of make all this work because there's a lot going on on these Holly harnesses and I like to kind of keep everything neat and organized. We've got uh, one major harness that goes to the engine. We've got one, uh, this guy here, that's from the transmission. We've got a power harness, which is essentially 
just going to the battery. And each one of those, except the power harness, the engine and trans harness both have a big relay and they each have a fuse on them. And of course the power harness also has a fuse. And these are just kind of on these little pigtails. So I wanted to keep everything neat and organized. So I started out by making a bracket that holds the computer to the firewall or the fender walls rather. Uh, attaches up here on the fender on each side. And then it attaches down below here with some quarter inch bolts. And that mounts the computer kind of at an angle and it goes over the stock wiring harness because I have, I'm not sure if we need it or not, but I did leave in the stock XJ computer. Um, so this is in all the harnesses stock underneath. We didn't have to touch that yet. Uh, the new Holly computer mounts here. And then I just TIG welded this little bracket that kind of bridges over the computer mount. Uh, you can still slide the computer in and out, no problem. But this little bridge here is just what holds all the relays and fuses for the Holly stuff. I just have them zip tied on now. I still have to take this off and paint it. And then I got some nice short little screws that are going to attach each and every one of those there. Um, the wiring, it, it took me forever to kind of figure out how I wanted to route this because I'm really picky and OCD about how wiring looks and I hate just stuff kind of piled wherever. Uh, so I routed it from the back of the engine. It follows the stock routing along the firewall here. It comes down. Uh, this is the power harness that's ultimately going to go through the cabin to the battery. And then we get some extra stuff here that's just not connected yet. But basically the harnesses run underneath the computer. They do one gentle loop and then they plug in. Well, you can't see a lot of the plugs, but they plug in down below there. Uh, the trans harness I felt like was just barely long enough, but we got that down. It kind of goes down on the top and then there's one plug on the passenger side for the major connector. And then there's one speed sensor on the back uh, driver's side of the 4L60. Other than that, uh, I tried to tuck everything kind of down in the valley between the intake and the valve cover here. That way you don't see a whole lot of wiring. Um, you know, we've got a few things, throttle position, idle air control. The inlet air temp, I haven't built the intake tube yet, but that'll plug right into there. Um, yeah, so far the wiring has been fairly straightforward. It just took me a whole lot of time to figure out where to mount the computer, how to run the wiring and get all that stuff kind of squared away. Uh, throttle cable, the stock throttle cable will not work, but I just went down to the local parts store. I picked up a throttle cable from uh, 97 to 99 uh, GM 1500 truck with a 5.7. Uh, those throttle cables are a lot longer. The stock one wasn't long enough and it also had the wrong end on it. So like I said, it's the GMT 400 L31 Vortec throttle cable. It plugs right in. Uh, this end is on the drive-by cable throttle body. This is the Holly bracket. I did have to ever so slightly trim back those little mounting ears to get it to slide in. No big deal. And then on the hole through the firewall, there's just two little plastic raised tabs on the throttle cable I had to grind off. Once again, not a big deal. Plugs right into place. All the lengths worked out perfectly. So the throttle cable is done. Uh, PCV system. I'm just kind of going through the list here. The PCV system is a bit of a hybrid because we're running an LS6 car intake on a LQ4 truck engine. And normally on the LS6 car intake, you've got just a really short U-shaped hose that goes from right behind the throttle blade down to the valley cover, which has a barb on it. And that's the PCV system on an LS6. And then the fresh air comes in from the passenger side valve cover. On an LQ4, an LM7, the LR4, the basically the LS truck motors, they have the same fresh air inlet on the driver's side valve cover. So we're going from the throttle body here. This is not under engine vacuum. This actually enters right by, or in front of the throttle plate here. So this is a fresh air inlet into the engine. The fresh air gets sucked through a port all the way back on the rear of the driver's side valve cover. And normally on a truck engine, the PCV port's back here on this side somewhere. But I, I, had, I don't have enough hose yet, but I need to go from the port on the back right down there. I'm probably going to go across the back of the motor, up this side, and attach right here, where normally the LS6 has a valley cover that comes right down there. So it's just a nice short hose. Uh, that's the PCV system taken care of. The steam port on the LS, you've got to make sure you run these. It could cause overheating if you don't. Uh, that's just a simple hose that goes from the stock location. And the Novak radiator does have two ports into it. They're not trans coolers. Uh, behind the AC fittings, but we just ran a hose barb to basically run the steam ports back into there. Uh, heater core, nothing special there because there is a 5 8 and a 3 quarter inch port on both the Jeep side and the LS engine side. Once again, simple connections to make there. 
Let's see, uh, power steering. I think that's the last thing I took care of under the hood that I can think of right at the moment. Uh, I just went down to Summit and I picked up a Earl's power steering hose kit. This is basically braided hydraulic hose. This is rated at all kinds of pressure. You don't want to use just standard AN line, even if it's the fancy braided stuff on a power steering system because power steering stuff makes in the thousands of pounds of pressure where an AN line is usually rated at like maybe three to 500. So make sure you use power steering specific hose for a power steering system. Anyhow, this was an Earl's kit. Uh, there's a couple different adapters that we needed to make this happen on the Jeep steering box. We've got a 16 millimeter O-ring here on the pressure side, a 14 millimeter O-ring on the return side. This is just standard braided stuff here because the return side has very minimal pressure, if any at all. On the back of the truck power steering pump, I believe that's also a 14 millimeter O-ring fitting. So the same as what we got here. I'll put all the part numbers in the description below, but it's just, that's basic standard stuff. Just about every GM power steering pump or power steering box has been the same forever. Um, so we got O-ring adapters there. Once again, very simple stuff. A Couple more things worth mentioning underneath here. We got the original drive lines modified. The rear one we had to lengthen by two and one half inches and the front one we shortened by about the same. So now we've got pretty good engagement on the little slip couplers there. A lot of you guys have asked how much further forward or back is the transfer case from where it was in the original setup with the Jeep at about two and a half inches on this particular application. But remember, we're running a 4L60 with an LQ4, an adapter to go to the stock 231. But in this instant, it, instance, it works out to be about two and a half inches further frontwards. Now, I did actually move the engine also in the midst of all this chaos because when I was doing the upper radiator hose, it just was way too tight uh, when it came to clearance to the AC pump. This radiator hose just was basically touching. And I've got this about as tight as it possibly can be up to the front of the fans here. So I pulled the motor out, I moved it back to the middle setting on the Novak mounts, which is roughly a half of an inch. And the reason I didn't do that before is because I had to modify the firewall. So there's a raised rib. Once again, not a huge deal, but I just had to do a little bit of grinding and cutting to get enough clearance to move the engine back that half of an inch so the cylinder head wouldn't rub against the firewall there. And once I moved it back by the half of an inch, now we've got plenty of clearance between the AC pump, pulley, and the radiator hose, so nothing's going to fit there. In terms of stuff left to do, I've got to interface with the stock Jeep wiring harness. We need to grab a couple of uh, signals. We got to get a start signal. So when you turn the key, it'll fire up just like it should. We got to grab a switched 12 volt that stays on while you have the engine run, or with the keys in the run position and while it's in the crank position. And I think I know where I'm going to grab those two things. Uh, this connector right here, this is a Jeep connector. It sits right underneath the uh, electrical junction block. One of these is the starter signal that went right to the starter on the four liter. So hopefully that'll work once we have power going to the rest of the Jeep harness. And then there were two other wires here that went to an alternator voltage regulator. And I'm hoping that one of these is going to be a switched 12 volt. And if so, I'll just grab this and that'll be what energizes the Holly computer when the key is turned up. Now, speaking of alternators and voltage regulators, we do have a bit of a conundrum. This is a LS3 car alternator. It's a DR44G and it is a two wire regulator, which basically means there are two wires on the back of it and you noticed they're not plugged in. Now, here's the reason for that. Um, in the Gen 4 LS stuff, a lot of the cars had something called a battery or a charging control module which basically sends a, I think it's like a 128 hertz pulse width modulated signal from this control module to the alternator. And that's what dictates how much uh, charge current is gonna produce. Now, normally there'll just be a switch 12 volt or a five volt signal going to an alternator and then it's internally regulated. But this one, it won't regulate unless it has that pulse width modulated signal coming from the control module. There's a little bit of looking. And I think a lot of guys have said that you can just run this unplugged with the battery wire going to it, and it'll still put out like 13.6 or 13.8 volts, but I'm not sure of that. So we're gonna start it up and see how it works. And if it doesn't charge properly, I mean, it's supposed to charge at like 14 and a half volts, 14.7, but at least this might get us by in the meantime, maybe. But if it doesn't, we'll just have to pull it out. I'm just gonna go with a single wire alternator, kind of like the hot rod guys do, because there's really no simple way to convert this. You know, you can't just go hook up one of those battery control module things because that's gonna interface with a whole bunch of other GM modules, which we don't have. 
And the other thing you could do is I think you can actually grab a voltage regulator from an older DR44 alternator, the four wire kind, and then just hook it up with a switch. But once again, that's kind of a pain in the butt. So we'll probably just end up switching to a traditional one wire alternator. Uh, after that, we get the few uh, wiring things taken care of, kind of like we mentioned. We'll add some fluids into this and we should be ready to fire it up. There's, once we do fire it up, there's just one or two more odds and ends. I've got to build an air intake tube with an inlet air temp sensor in it. And then finally, I've got to build a bracket to attach the Jeep shift cable onto the 4L60 transmission. Uh, we did get one with the, from Novak, but it didn't work with this firewall because it's just too close to the, or the trans tunnel rather. So a little bit of custom fab work there left to go. We are getting so close to firing up this Jeep for the first time. And don't hold me to this, but I hope the next video that you guys see on the Jeep, I hope it's firing up for the first time because this thing is going to sound awesome. And that's a major milestone in any project. I got to say thank you guys for watching. It'll bring this video to an end here. Uh, do me a favor though, click the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you like any of the merch that we've got, like the Treadless Trucking t-shirt, which is one of my personal favorites, uh, head on over to TolmanPerformance.com and grab one that'll help support the channel, help buy tires for burnouts and ridiculous stuff like that. Uh, but once again, thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it and we'll catch you in a couple more days.